Good morning, SoFlo Church. How are we doing? Good? Awesome. Hey, it's great to be here with you. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Bryson Cook. I have uh, the honor of serving as a campus pastor on the staff of Southeast Christian Church, a church up in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm at our Indiana campus up there. It's my home church uh, where I actually grew up. When my family started attending there when I was eight years old. And so to be able to serve in that capacity at my home church has just been a blessing. I want to show you a picture of my family too. I got a picture of uh, my wife Holly here with our two sweet little girls. That's Madison holding blue. Louie right there. She's almost three years old. And then baby Lucy there in her car seat. She just turned six months. And what's sweet is they are actually not here with me right now because after I get done here this morning with you, I am flying up to Panama City to drive about 30, 45 minutes away to St. George Island. Uh, we are vacationing with my wife's family this week in Florida. Um, so I wanted to stop by here and spend time with you all before heading up. Uh, my wife and my daughters are someplace with her mom and dad in Alabama driving, and I'm praying that Lucy's not screaming in her car seat right now. So lift up my wife. <laughs> in prayer. Uh, here's the deal. Some of you in this room might be wondering, hey, why is this random guy from Indiana, Louisville, Kentucky, down here in South Florida at SoFlo Church this morning? The reason I'm here is because I love you all. And I know that might sound weird, like I've just met you all for the very first time. But in a sense, I haven't, because in a sense, you have been in my heart and in my prayers long before uh, I'm standing here before you now. Because here's the deal, my church, Southeast Christian Church, loves you, loves SoFlo. We love Jamie and Alex and the kids. They have deep roots back at Southeast. We partner with you, SoFlo, in so many different ways. And so I am here this morning, hopefully and prayerfully, just to be a blessing and a gift for you in however way the Lord plans to use our time together. And so it's an honor, it's a privilege. I just wanna begin us with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thanks for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come together in your presence and, and worship you and celebrate the good news of the life and the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Uh, we pray just blessing over this time. Spirit, lead us uh, in our conversations around the scriptures today. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, in my 29, almost 30 years of existence here on this earth, I have come to find that one core truth about us as humanity is this. We love a good debate, right? We love a good debate. We love having our opinions on something and going at each other. Uh, like, for instance, the greatest basketball player of all time. Is it LeBron James or Michael Jordan, right? Or what's the best phone, Apple or Android? Back home, it's college hoops for us around Louisville, Kentucky. It's Cardinals or Wildcats or Hoosiers. Down here, is it Hurricanes and Gators? What's the, uh, is that close enough? Do what? The Knowles. Oh, okay, okay, the Knowles, all the way down south? I love that, okay. Uh, one of my favorite debates is the infamous dress debate of 2015. Do you guys remember this? Uh, is, the, is the dress blue and black, or is it white and gold? I just wanna just put this to rest for good this morning. Would you raise your hand in this room if you see white and gold when you look at this dress? Raise your hand so we can please know who to pray for this morning. Uh, <laughs> I, I, if, it's, if it's not blue and black, uh, I, my eyes need to be checked. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Debates are fun, right? Some debates. Other debates, a little more weighty, carry a little more, a little more emotion in them. How about this debate question? The Bible, inspired word of God or archaic, outdated text? I don't think it's an overstatement by any means to say that that question of what is the Bible and how are we to relate to it is one of the more controversial topics in our culture, right? You have some folks on one side of the debate that maybe there's more of a sense of apathy around the Bible. Of, well, you know, the Bible, it's, it's old, it was written by some people long ago. Uh, maybe there's some good truths in there and some cool stories to kind of drive it home, but let's be honest, it's definitely not the inspired word of God. It's not true, and I just don't think it's relevant to my life. At some people within an apathetic camp, uh, there's some people that carry more aggression towards the Bible. 
The Bible, don't you know the Bible's dangerous? Like if you were, if you were to start to read the Bible, it would lead you down a path towards like narrow-mindedness and intolerance or, or bigotry. All that said, though, I was reading a recent Barna Group study, and it determined that around 54% of Americans claim, listen, that the Bible is helpful for leading a life that is possessive of, of meaning and, and purpose. I find that interesting. 54% of Americans say that. And yet, listen to these statistics, despite that number, to date, only 39% of Americans report on average reading the Bible three to four times, not per day, not per week, not per month, per year. Only three to four times per year. Another 32% of Christians who identify with the Protestant movement report reading their Bibles daily, with another 27% reporting, ah, you know, I, I maybe crack it open once a week. And so where, do, where does that leave us? We have one side of the debate where there's apathy or there's aggression towards the Bible. There's a, another half of our culture and our country that says, no, the Bible's important. But the statistical majority don't even regularly engage with it. And so where does that leave us in conversations about what the Bible is and what it means for our lives? And my simple answer would be this, Jesus Listen, I'm a, I'm a 29-year-old millennial, and I deeply love and trust the scriptures. And if you were to ask me why, my number one answer would not be, well, because my parents or my pastors taught me uh, to read and trust the Bible, or you know, I've, I've read articles or watched documentaries on the validity of the scriptures or archaeological evidence that back up the scriptures. No, those things are all so good and so important, and the Lord has used them in mighty ways. But the number one reason why I would tell you I love and trust the scriptures is because of Jesus. That our God in his time here on this earth walking among us loved and continues to love these texts. He read and taught from the Bible of his day in synagogues. And as he would travel around, he held and holds that the overarching story of the Bible is the way in which to interpret the world around us, including his mission within it. He held that the scriptures are divinely inspired. He fought temptation in the wilderness with scripture. And in one of my favorite images from the gospels, in the gospel of Luke, Jesus has risen from the dead. He has appeared to his disciples and they are floored. Like, what are you doing here right now? And in a powerful moment, Jesus points to the entirety of the scriptures and says, look, guys, all of it points to me. And so I want to make a point here that may sound profound, but I hope it's not for those of us in this room. I don't believe that there's any way in which someone can truly follow Jesus and not take the Bible seriously as God's word in their lives. I don't think there's any way. And I know as I say that, maybe there's some of us in this room who would say, well, Bryson, like, I'm, I'm new to this whole church thing and, and exploring Jesus, and I have some serious doubts and questions about the scriptures. Or, or maybe you're here in this room and you're like, Bryson, you don't know my story. Like, I'm, I'm kind of coming back to exploring faith in, in Jesus again, but there was a point in my life where, where someone in a sinful manner used words on the pages of scripture to, to hurt me or harm me. And listen, if, if that's you, I just need you to know that I see you, that the Lord sees you. And I think there's an invitation to just take Jesus' hand and keep walking into deeper relationship with him and fall more in love with him and in doing so, grow to learn to love the scriptures more and more. And so we're gonna talk about the Bible today by continuing in your series through the Psalms over the course of this summer. And we're gonna be digging into a passage of scripture that I think talks in very beautiful ways about what the scriptures truly are. It's kind of an inception moment. If you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, we're gonna start right there in verse one. We'll have them up here on the screens as well. Psalm 19, verse one, we're told that this is a Psalm of David. We're not sure when he wrote this Psalm or what the context of his life looked like at the time, but I want to picture in my mind that David is sitting on the beach here in West Palm and he is watching that sunrise come up over the horizon because he starts in verse one and says, hey, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. 
David goes on for the next six verses to describe the natural creation. He talks about the sky and the sun and how God reveals himself through his creation. But starting in verse 7, David shifts his attention towards the beauty of, of Scripture, of God's word revealed in the Scriptures and how it reveals God's power and his presence on display. Anybody remember back in ancient times where we listened to these things called CDs? You guys remember this? Uh, and if you were listening to a song, you didn't have Spotify where you could scroll down and look at the lyrics of the song. Uh, you had to actually open up the case and pull the little booklet out and turn to where the song was to read the lyrics. Uh, it, here's the deal. If you're newer to the Bible, you may not know this, but as we're working through the Psalms, the Psalms are actually ancient worship lyrics written by God's people in worship towards him. And so I just want to read these divinely inspired worship lyrics over us this morning. Verse seven, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm. All of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, they, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth. And this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I don't know if you caught that, but there's a stretch there of verses where David uses six different words, law, statutes, precepts, commands, fear, decrees, to describe God's word that is captured for us in the scriptures. And truthfully, I remember reading this psalm for the very first time and almost thinking, you know, David, it seems like you're being a little redundant, kind of like you're saying the same thing over and over again. But when you take the time to slow down and dig in, we see the fullness of the beauty of what David is communicating through the Holy Spirit in this moment. David starts, he says, hey, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. At word law, it's the word Torah. It's used uh, early on in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers and Deuteronomy to describe the 613 commands that were given to Moses by God to the Israelites in the wilderness. But that word Torah, law, also became a way of later on describing the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then even later on, a way of kind of encompassing the wholeness of the Old Testament. And if you have read through your Old Testament, you know the Old Testament is the story of God's plan unraveling, his plan of redemption that just is laid out that ultimately leads to Jesus as we turn to the Gospel of Matthew. And so, listen, if you are walking through life exhausted, where just the wear and tear on your soul feels so great and you feel completely empty, David is telling us, look, the scriptures will lead you into God's framework of redemptive story of creation that leads to Jesus. And in Jesus, there is a refreshing and revival, ultimate restoration of your soul. David says, hey, the, the statutes of the Lord, they're, they're trustworthy. That word statutes in the Hebrew, it, it can also be translated as testimony. And our mind obviously goes to a court of law, right? Like a witness on a stand, but this could also be used to describe an insight or opinion on the validity of something. And so uh, listen, if the many shifting beliefs of the world have left you in a place of not knowing what truth is, that you just feel aimless, you feel like Satan has been feeding you lie after lie after lie and you don't know what's right and wrong anymore. Listen, the scriptures will lead you into God's testimony of himself and his world and it is trustworthy and he provides true wisdom for how to live life well. Precepts. David goes on, he says, the precepts of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. That word precepts is used to describe general rules for behavior or thought. And so listen, maybe there's some stories in here. Uh, of some of us who have just lived lives of, of chasing all of these different things that we thought would ultimately fill the hole in our heart, whether that's more money or more job security or more stuff or more one night stands or more alcohol or more whatever, whatever will numb the pain, but it's ultimately still left us empty. 
and depressed and riddled with anxiety. Listen, David says the scriptures will lead you into God's way of living and experiencing a truly abundant life, filling your heart with fullness and joy that is only found in Jesus. He goes on again. He says, hey, the commands, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. That word command in the Hebrew, it's similar to another Hebrew word for signposts, pointing the right direction in which to walk. And so listen, if you find yourself in a place where you just feel like life is aimless, like it just feels so dark, life is meaningless, you're asking the question of why am, what am I even doing here? Does my life have any purpose? Listen, the scriptures will lead you into God's commands and his truth that is a radiating light out into a dark world that provides clarity of your purpose and your value and your calling. Fear. David says the, the fear of the Lord is, is pure. And that word fear is, is not describing like, uh, fear or, or terror like we would describe it, like I'm afraid of something. When the Bible talks about fear, it's this awe, it's this reverence, it's this attention given to God's power and his glory above us. And so if you live life gripped in fear, if you're constantly living in a state of anxiety and not knowing what's gonna play out with, with your job or, or the economy, or if you just don't know if you can make it through one more moment of the pain that you're experiencing in life, listen, the scriptures will lead you into a sense of deeper fear and reverence towards God that reminds you that when the world seems like it's falling apart, he is the one on the throne and he is in control. And David closes out this section of different words with the word decrees. The decrees of the Lord are, are firm. The word decrees in the Hebrew is the word mishpat, which can also be translated as justice. So listen, if life has just beaten you up, if the cancer diagnosis stole the loved one or disability marks the child or it seems like death and violence have won, listen, the scriptures will lead you into a reminder of God's justice that he is with you in the here and now, no matter what you are experiencing. And there is coming a day for those of us in Christ where one day we will be ushered into eternity where there's no more sickness and no more suffering and no more sin and no more death. Jesus has won. David goes on and he says, by them, by the words of God, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden sins. And faults. Like, Lord, the, the things that I don't even know that I do that harm and, and hurt you and others around me, and it hurts your heart as your heart just breaks over me, Lord, convict me of those things. He goes on, he says, Lord, also keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. That language of ruling over, it's the image in the Hebrew of an animal that is crouching and ready to devour its prey. Lord, do not let the things in my life that tempt me, that Satan throws at me, don't let them consume me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgression. That is so good. David is just painting this beautiful picture of scripture. And I know, I know there can be this cynical voice that says, well, duh, of course David's gonna write that. He's one of the authors of the Bible, right? Just discounting the fact that the Holy Spirit is working through David, but, but listen. One of my good friends and teammates back at Southeast named Carl once shared with our church these stats that were once collected by what is called the Center for Biblical Engagement. They did a pretty extensive study a few years back to look at the fruit that is evident in the lives of those who regularly interact with the scriptures. And the stats were pretty staggering. I think we have some of them up here on the screen for you. It was determined that with those that were studied that reading the Bible four plus times for, per week, all of a sudden you saw an astronomical decrease in some of these areas of people's lives, whether it was drinking in excess by 62%, or viewing pornography dropping by 59%, or lashing out in anger by 31%, and you can keep going down the list, gossiping and, and feeling bitter and self-destructive thinking and having difficulty forgiving and feeling discouraged and experiencing loneliness and feeling spiritually stagnant. All of these areas of our lives decreasing and dropping whenever scripture is so integrated into the life of an individual. I went a little further past the numbers and I asked some friends on Facebook to just finish this sentence. In making scripture a regular part of my life, fill in the blank. I've been moved from loneliness to belonging in a sense of home. 
I've been moved from searching for happiness in the world and only finding misery to being filled with joy in Jesus, even when things around me aren't going the way that I want. I've been moved from feeling confused and unsure of what truth really is to now having a place of of guidance and clear direction. I've been moved from an unforgiving heart to being able to extend the forgiveness that I never thought I could give until I really understood what Jesus had done for me. And then this is from me, Bryson. In in reading scripture, I've been moved from someone controlled by incredibly low self-esteem and anxiety and depression, and thoughts of, would anyone even care if I wasn't alive anymore? To instead, knowing my identity and my purpose and my value as an image bearer of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus and dearly loved by him. And listen, that same transformation is available in your life. And I wanna be clear, it's, it's not words on a page that bring about that transformation. It is the one that you come to know and love in deeper and deeper ways through his word who brings about the transformation. That every time we come to scripture, we are not just reading words on a page, we are getting to sit at the feet of Jesus. Like Mary in the story of Mary and Martha, who's just sitting there and basking in Jesus's presence and receiving his love. I love, in light of that, how David closes out this psalm in verse 14. He says, may these words of my mouth in this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's two things that stick out immediately for me in this, in this closing verse. One is how Uh, closely connected, the words of David's mouth is to his heart. I'm reminded of Jesus in the Gospels, right, where he says that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, which is why I also love how David, in his focus on the heart, uses that word meditation or meditate. I don't know what comes to mind when you think of the word meditate or meditation. Maybe for you, it's, it's envisioning someone in a yoga studio on a mat, and they're doing a move that if you tried it, your back would lock up, right? Or uh, maybe it's this idea of like this Eastern mysticism, and I'm emptying my mind and like connecting with this deeper inner reality within me. And I just want to throw out everything in the world and the culture around us and just ask the question of what does the Bible mean with this word meditation in this context? What, is that, what does that mean? I love how pastor and author Rich Viotis puts it. He says, biblical meditation, in the sense that the Bible uses the word, is defined as chewing on the scriptures and the words and the truth of God so that they penetrate our hearts. It's this idea of allowing God's word to just infuse itself into our hearts and minds so that it's just spilling out in our prayers and in our conversations There's two kind of Hebrew word pictures that are used as illustrations in the scriptures around this word. One is of resounding music. I want you real fast to turn to your neighbor next to you and share with them your absolute favorite song of all time. Go. (laughs) Love it. Lots of laughing. Some of you are like, I didn't want to share my favorite song this morning. Why'd you make me do this? Uh, (laughs) I don't know. uh, I don't know if you remember that moment when you remember hearing your favorite song for the first time. Can you go back to that moment? And maybe it comes on the radio or you're driving in a car or whatever it looks like. And you hear that song and you're just getting chills, right? Because the melody is beautiful and the lyrics are like, oh my gosh, this is like speaking to my life, right? On this deep way. Like, this is amazing. David is saying, look, when he comes to the scriptures, it's like this resounding music is just playing in his heart and he just can't help but hit repeat over and over and over again, spamming the repeat button. Uh, Another way in which this word meditate or meditation in the Hebrew is pictured is comes to us via Isaiah in his book. He uses the image of a lion that has just killed its prey and it's roaring with this pride and this sense of delight in this meal that it's about to experience. And if that's a little gory for you, we as humanity do this all the time, right? You, you cook a really good meal and you take a bite and we all do the universal sound for this tastes amazing, right? One, two, three, mmm, right? 
my wife and I were uh, thinking back because our oldest is almost three and we've been crying. Like time flies by so fast. Uh, we were looking back over old videos and photos of Madison when she was younger. And there was a time a little bit past a year, maybe, you know, 17, 19 months where she figured this out. I don't know if she was watching us or whatever, but all of a sudden, whether it was mac and cheese or water, everything was, mmm, check this out. Can I have one? Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> what is David ultimately giving us here? He says this, whether it is a beautiful song, just on repeat in your heart, or whether it is like tasting the best meal you've ever had. David is painting the picture of someone who has come to know and just deeply love the scriptures and just is content to sit with them as long as he can because as he says in verse 10, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. It's a sense of just deep delight of letting the scriptures just sink in. It's the image of, of not rushing through reading. He's, he is willing to just sit and sit and sit and just bask in the words of the Lord. I think that's really important for us. This conversation around when David talks about this meditation on scripture and, and what does that mean? Because to be honest, listen, I think our culture around us instills the absolute opposite in us as humanity, right? Like we live in a culture that is go, 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 right? 24 seven, hustle and bustle all over the place. And that leads to us engaging with information in the same way, right? Our Instagram reels are on average only 10 seconds long, right? All of our attention spans have been fried by the internet in so many different ways. Uh, and and all, there's just more information at our fingertips than, than anyone has had at any point in human history. And sociologists are determining that that is affecting the ways in which we engage with information. Like we are primarily what is called informational readers. And so we're, we're coming at different data or articles or stories. And we're like, hey, how do I condense all of this information down as much as I can into the quickest way to consume it? So give me the spark notes, give me the summary, right? Just give me the gist of it. And if we're not careful, this becomes very self-serving, very transactional. Like I'm just coming to a source of information to get what I need quickly and then, and then I'm leaving for the next best thing. And unfortunately, if we're not careful, that can spill into how we engage with the scriptures. Pastor and author John Ortberg recently, or a few years ago, recounted uh, one year where he set out to pray through one psalm every single day, which I think is a beautiful challenge if you wanted to lean into that as you all as a congregation are reading through the psalms. But he recounts this moment as he set out to pray through this one psalm every day. He said, a strange thing happened. I found that my goal became just to get through the Psalms. Each day that I did it, I could check it off my list. It was as if in my mind, God had a great big behavior modification chart on the refrigerator of heaven. And every time I made it through a Psalm, I got a gold star. And he goes on to say, naturally, this utterly sabotaged God's real purpose. God wants to speak to us and to renew us. And if he is using just one Psalm or even one word to do that in a giving setting, our job is to just stick with it as long as it takes to learn what we need to learn. The goal is not for us to get through the scriptures. The goal is to get the scriptures through us. I think that's beautiful. Because here's the deal for all of the stats and the stories that we talked about, the transformation that can be experienced in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit when we engage in the scriptures. Listen, it is possible to read the scriptures and not experience deep transformation in our lives. It's the, it's the person who starts a, a Bible in a year plan. And I love Bible in a year plans. I, I try to engage with one every year, but maybe we've all had this moment where schedules get busy and all of a sudden we've fallen behind a couple days. And so we're cramming a bunch of days together at a time and just reading all this scripture and we're not really even internalizing what we're reading. Or it's, it's possible 
to be someone who knows all of this head knowledge and and doctrine and, and biblical language, Greek and Hebrew. And listen, that's important. Like deep study of the scriptures in that way is important. That's how I even wrote a message like this. But it's possible to have a big head theologically and yet not be transformed more and more into a person who's more loving or more patient or more kind because that knowledge just remains up here as knowledge and doesn't move into your heart and through your hands to the world around you. And so listen, the invitation is to not just be informational readers of the Bible, but transformational readers. If you've heard that language of devotional reading, it's the idea of when I come to the scriptures, I am taking that heart posture that David gives for us, where I'm not just reading to read. I'm not just reading to check off my list for the day of, yep, I was a good Christian today. I I read from my Bible. I'm not just treating the Bible like a textbook where I pull it off a shelf just to get an answer to a question or a debate and then put it back. No, I let every word when I engage with it, I let every word and phrase sink in as it moves from my head to my heart and the Holy Spirit deeply shapes my heart through the scriptures. It's where I'm, I'm not just simply reading the text, I'm letting the text read me. And that I am truly envisioning that every time I sit with my Bible open, I am not just reading words on a page, I am sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I'm experiencing his love for me and his grace for me and his deep desire to go deeper and deeper and deeper in terms of pulling me in to knowing him more and more and more. We're gonna close today, in a sense, by kind of practicing what we preach. And I know for some of us, when we talk about this idea of devotional reading with the scriptures, we we might have different practices that we're already doing in our lives, whether it's, for some of us, maybe it's having a journal open when you read, like you're someone that likes to write down prayers that come to mind as you're reading scripture, or uh, maybe you're someone who puts up post-it notes around your house or in your car with, with scriptures on them so that they are just uh, being sinking in deeper and deeper into your heart and mind and coming out in your prayers. Uh, my mother-in-law likes to do this where she will take a passage of scripture and write it out like five, six, seven, seven times to just internalize it and, and work to memorize the scriptures. But if you don't have a a practice, if you're newer to engaging with the Bible, I just want to give you five words uh, that I try to do every time I'm I'm sitting with the scriptures um, that I think uh, helps me as I'm engaging with with God through his text. And those words are, are silence, read, meditate, and pray, and contemplate. I want to start this morning just by centering our hearts on that, that first word, silence. We live in this world, like I said, that it's just crazy, right? There's always noise and always sound and all this stimulus all around us. And it can be very easy sometimes, even as we're coming to the scriptures, to just open the Bible with our minds still racing with all of the stress and anxiety around us. And the invitation is when we engage the text, just taking that moment to remind ourselves that we are in God's presence in that moment and we're getting to look at him face to face and feel his love for us and his deep care for us and and start off with a word of prayer. And so I just wanna give you a moment um, before we read a passage of scripture together, uh, just to sit in God's presence and just to talk with him and, and feel his love for you in this moment. going to read a passage of scripture together, but we're not going to just read. We're going to meditate as, as David tells us. If there are certain words or phrases that just kind of rise to the surface or that um, just speak to your heart in the season of life that you're in right now, would you just hang on those words? We're going to read the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. going to read, but we're also going to pay close attention to each and every word. 
It says this, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you or persecute you or falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Listen, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As we've taken a moment to, to read and to hang on every word that Jesus says in this stretch of scriptures, I now want to move into that fourth word, just prayer. And I just want to, provide for you an opportunity just to pray to God, a prayer of a word or phrase, whatever rose off of the page for you and ministered to your heart in a significant way this morning, would you just turn that back as a prayer to God in this moment? word. It just says contemplate. It's, uh, I don't know about you all, but it's very easy sometimes for me after I finish a prayer, say amen, and I'm off to the next thing. Um, but just the, the reality of even after finishing your prayer, just continuing to just sit in and just, just feel God's love for you and even envision your day before you and how you can live out the scripture that you read over and engaged with God in prayer over this morning. So just continue to take just a moment of just sitting in God's presence and envisioning the rest of your day and how you can live out this scripture as you go. Father, we love you. We are so grateful that through the Holy Spirit, you spoke through authors, the writers, the poets, the prophets, that your word is preserved for us in the scriptures, even, even to this day, continuing to shape us and form us as you, Holy Spirit, grow in us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Father, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus. You sent him into this world to live the life that none of us could live and to give his life on the cross so that through his life, his death, his resurrection, through faith in him, we could experience forgiveness and redemption, eternal life. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we do every week, we are going to share communion together as followers of Jesus. And if you're new here at SoFlo or, or new to uh, church in, in general and you're, you're wondering, you know, why are we stopping in the service to share a meal together? That seems a little weird. Like uh, This is a sacred and a holy meal that followers of Jesus have shared for the last 2,000 years. And I, I love this moment where the Apostle Paul is writing in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, and he lays out in chapter 11 uh, what this moment of communion looks like. 
If you don't have a communion cup, looks like we got some in the back that are gonna be coming around to you. You raise your hand if you, if you need a cup. We'll, we'll bring one around. I love how the... I love how the Apostle Paul lays out this moment of communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he, as he's telling it, he is recounting the, the last night of Jesus' life before his crucifixion where he is sitting with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper. And he's using the image of this Passover meal that was given to the, the Jewish people long before. Uh, as they were coming out of uh, slavery in Egypt and was practiced throughout Israel all through the years. And now it's come to this moment where Jesus is pointing to the fact that just like the scriptures, this Passover meal has been pointing to him. And he writes this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul says this, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. But the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we share the bread together as a reminder of Jesus's body that was pierced for us on the cross. And so church family, let's take a moment to share the bread together. Paul goes on and he says this in verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we share the cup together, we are reminded of Jesus's blood that was shed and poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins. And so let's share the cup together. closes it this way. He says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so Jesus, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this meal that you gave to your disciples that has been passed down to us, this tangible reminder every week as we gather together of your sacrifice for us, of your life and your death and your resurrection that has opened the door for us that when we place our faith and our trust in you, we are ushered into forgiveness and healing and restoration and eternal life that begins now and it lasts forever. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.